Hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome to today's episode of Badcast. Today is May 23rd, 2023. It's a Tuesday. Uh, I'm Rifat Mannan in California, and I'm remotely joined by my good friend Emilio Madrigal in Boston. So today, Hi, Emilio. Today, we are extremely delighted to have with us a very special guest, Dr. Neil Thies, and who shares a very uh, significant connection with Batcast. And, uh, and uh, we are so privileged and honored to say that uh, he was the first speaker for Batcast when we started in 2016 and when Emilia and I were residents in Mount Sinai. So he gave the first talk. It was uh, um, on um, fatty liver disease. I still remember he, wa he biked all the way from Lower East Side to Midtown Manhattan on 10th Street and 59th Avenue and reached there before eight o'clock in the morning and delivered this uh, lecture. I, I have a, if you allow Dr. Tease, I have a um, small presentation on that. Let me, let me share that quickly with you. Of course. <laughs> So this is our first lecture. Uh, you can see here Dr. Thies, and you can also see our uh, residence at Mount Sinai West, as it is called now. And at that time we were using Periscope and let me play this quick short clip. And, and here's Dr. Thies talking about- Little stringy things Mallory Dank bodies. Um, now you can prove the Mallory Dank bodies by doing a CAM 5.0. So yeah. So things have changed and we are now in 2023 and we welcome you back, Dr. Tease. And Dr. Tease needs no introduction. At, uh, Dr. Tease is professor of pathology at NYU Grossman School of Medicine. And he is well known for his work in liver pathology and his scientific research. He has been a pioneer in adult stem cell plasticity and anatomy of human interst interstitium through on which he has done a lot of work. And in fact, for the past 20 years, he has been fascinated by the science of complex system from the infinitesimal level of quantum form to the infinite vastness of our entire universe. So today, uh, Dr. Thies is going to share with us his perspective of being uh, a pathologist and how he connects different systems and how he connects his concept about complex system. and. We will also talk about Dr. Thies's new book. So that is, uh, I will show you here. So this is his new book, which is available. The Notes on Complexity, A Scientific Theory of Connection, Consciousness and Being. And Dr. Thies will discuss today about, of course, how it relates to pathology and what are his perspectives on different things which are very close to pathology. So thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Thies. Thanks a lot. Oh, no, thank you, Rifat. Um, as you know, I've been itching to talk about this stuff more publicly for a really long time, and I don't mean just the complexity stuff, but about how I view pathology. So uh, this is an awesome opportunity. Thank you. It's our pleasure. It's an honor to host you, Dr. Thies. So no, 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 no. It's an honor to be hosted. No, 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 no. It's an honor to host <laughs> <laughs> no, no worries. So like, let us get started. Uh, let us start with uh, your talk on stem cell needs. And in your article on stem cell <clears throat> needs and tissue biology, you discussed about uh, tissue biology, which should be distinct uh, from cell biology and molecular biology, which is well known as defined disciplines, but we don't talk much about tissue biology. Can you explain more about of what you mean by tissue biology and what are your thoughts about it, Dr. Thies? Sure. Um, you know, the, the for, as, as you saw, I shared some of this with you. The first time I wrote about this was all the way back in 2003. Um, and I've written about it subsequently in stem cell journals and in liver journals, but never yet in a pathology journal. But uh, today I get to go direct to the pathology audience, which I appreciate. Um, where this started, where I started thinking about this was in the early days of my stem cell work. And um, in 1999, uh, my group had um, done, working with Diane Krauss at Yale, 
um, we had shown in a mouse model that bone marrow stem cells could become hepatocytes. And the prior year, 19, it was published uh, the, the, in science, the discovery of the year in science were three papers, um, one showing bone, to, uh, bone marrow to brain, one showing bone to skeletal, bone marrow to skeletal muscle, and one showing bone marrow to liver. That paper in the liver was done by a friend of mine named Brian Peterson at Pittsburgh. And we discovered while we were doing the experiments before the papers were written that we were in fact doing the same experiments and um, we're on the same track. And rather than compete with each other, we decided um, to try and supplement each other. And we coordinated so that when he submitted his paper to science, because those other two papers had been submitted to science, we submitted ours to nature. His got accepted, ours got rejected. And this was my first realization that scientists, real scientists, um, meaning cell biologists and molecular biologists, have no idea what they're doing when they look at their animal models. One reviewer, the paper was rejected at Nature without the opportunity to, um, uh, to, um, to revise. And there were two comments that were really striking. First off, there was a photomicrograph of, well, the, the first comment was, there's no data in the paper, there's only photomicrograph. And obviously photomicrographs, we all know this is data. <laughs> this is data when we're presenting clinical cases, where this is data when we're writing up case reports. This is data when we do path, clinical path correlation studies. This is data when we do basic science things in human tissues, which is what we do. And they couldn't recognize it as data even. Um, the other reviewer who recognized it as data, but said it was lousy data because we had a picture of an autofluorescent hepatocyte in a field of hepatocytes. So it was a, a high power, you know, there were about 10 hepatocytes in the field and they were autofluorescing in green because of bilirubin breakdown products, which, hepatocyte, human, which mouse hepatocytes do. Um, the blue stained, dappy stained nucleus. And in the middle cell, there was a red chromosome that was a Y chromosome that we had marked by in situ hybridization. And this was a male bone marrow into a female mouse. So the Y chromosome indicated this was an hepatocyte that derived from a circulating bone marrow stem cell. And he said, the, the, the reviewer said, how do you know that this isn't a lymphocyte? And well, it's an hepatocyte. <laughs> it's polygonal, it's not round. There's a, a measurement bar in the thing. So a lymphocyte is the size of an hepatocyte nucleus or smaller. It's integrated into liver cell plates all around it. At the tissue level, there's no question that this is an hepatocyte. And it even has a functional marker because of the autofluorescence in green. And again, scientists, top tier scientists, if they're reviewing for nature, who couldn't see what was right in front of them as a significant data point. Um, we submitted it to several journals, and finally, a year later, it came out December um, of 2000, and was the cover of hepatology. And in hepatology, I was able to specify uh, a list of reviewers who I knew would understand what this was. But Science, PNAS, some other journals, they all had a problem with the fact that we had no data in the paper. And this got me thinking about how basically they're telling me and my colleagues that we're not scientists, that we're not presenting a scientific paper. And, and I was like, you know, how can that be? This is obviously science. And it started to occur to me that the, we as pathologists, how often do we say things? Do we catch ourselves saying things? I've said it a lot. Well, I'm not really a scientist, but dot, 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 and then I offer an opinion. We're not really scientists. Scientists don't think of ourselves as, think of us as scientists, but often we don't think of ourselves as scientists either. And this is where I first came face to face with this modesty about whether I'm a scientist or not, um, is based on false principles. And the fact is that we are scientists, 
And the science we practice is the science of tissue biology. And you will find, um, which means looking at tissues and organs, biological functions at the tissue level, not at the cellular level and the molecular level. And you won't find any graduate student programs in tissue biology because there are none. But there are residency training programs in diagnostic anatomic pathology. And these are formal postdoctoral training programs in how to identify what's going on in the tissue. And when you think about studying something like stem cells, around that time, people were just for the first time starting to talk about a stem cell niche in the, um, in the bone marrow for about a year, year and a half. And I heard about this at stem cell meetings. And I thought to myself, is there a stem cell niche in the liver? And I had already done work on the canal of herring as a as a source of stem cells. And I realized, oh, this is a stem cell niche. Um, and it's comprised of all the cells that are involved, the canal of herring itself, the stem cells within the canal of herring, the endothelial cells, the hepatocytes, the macrophages, the lymphocytes, all the cells that are active around it. The communications between which create the turning on or the turning off of a progenitor cell or a stem cell and a disease we recognize when it turns on as the ductular reaction. You can't see the quiescent niche or the activated ductular reaction um, at the cellular level or at the molecular level. They only reveal themselves as you build up the system back from the reductionist things, which are obviously very successful, but you have to take that reductionist data of the molecular stuff back to the cellular level and the cellular level back up to the tissue level. And we're the people who do that. So I feel very strongly that we should be thinking more commonly that we are tissue biologists, that we are scientists, and we have insights that nobody else is likely to have. And the final note I'll make on this, for those of you who are interested in academic work, um, if particularly if you have a, a an area of specialty, um, uh, an organ of subspecialty. Um, I find that once I get involved with people who are looking at the liver, which is my subspecialty, um, doing animal work, doing basic science work, they have no idea what is happening in their animal models. I've been at meetings where um, a picture of a mouse liver with a, with a chemical injury has been shown, and they say, oh, here we have an example of acute hepatitis caused by a toxin. And I have to raise my hand at the end and, and ask them to bring the picture back. And I go, I'm sorry, that's a bile infarct. You've got a beautiful model for bile infarcts, but it's not a model. So because the people in the laboratories are not trained to do this either. So if, if you're in an institution where there's basic science going on and you're longing for an academic career, but aren't sure how to do that or where to go, find out from your chairman or you know whatever liaisons there are between your department and other departments, maybe happening in your own department, who's doing animal work in your organ where they're using a model, an animal model um, in your organ of specialty. And you will give them information that will make their work valid, you know, <laughs> and they'll give you the opportunity to see how you are in fact a scientist. We already are scientists. We just don't think of ourselves as that. Yeah, no, this is a great perspective, Dr. Thies. And I think uh, we need to know more about it and uh, value ourselves as pathologists more as a tissue biologist because we are. And uh, this is a different perspective that needs to be given due attention, I would say. Yeah. So uh, moving on, Dr. Thies, I have another question for you. Uh, I have heard that. Uh, you quote a Jain teacher in many of your talks about discoveries on stem cells and your talks on human interstitium. And it says something like, in the mind of the beginner, there are many possibilities, whereas in the mind of the expert, there are a few. What does this mean to you? And how has it guided your clinical or research practice? Can you please elaborate? Yeah, sure. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes. Um, I'll have another quote for you in a little while, I think. But this one, um, so, you know, I'm not only 
actually, uh, Rafat, can you put keep your face on? Then oh, yeah. I can be talking sure. to you. Okay, cool. <laughs> it's easier to have a face to look at. Thank you. Um, right. <laughs> um, you can go and do something. I just need oh, something. No, no problem. Yeah. Sure. Um, so for 35 years, I've also been a practicing Zen student, which means I meditate, I go on retreats, I study Zen texts. And this quote is um, from the, a Japanese Zen master who came to America named Shinryu Suzuki. Um, and he founded the San Francisco Zen Center. So if anyone is in San Francisco and have heard of the Zen Center, he founded it. And this is, he wrote a very famous book, a very important book uh, for the introduction of Zen to America called Zen Mind, Zen Mind Beginner's Mind. And the title comes from this quote, in the mind of the beginner, there are many possibilities. In the mind of the expert, there are few. And my first, the, the first um, way I, I realized this came to touch on my work as a pathologist is that as a liver pathologist, um, as we know, anyone who's done liver pathology knows that the practice is not to start with the history, but to start with the slide because the information on the, in the history is often incomplete, maybe misleading, and the liver has such a limited range of tissue responses. It's easy if you're told something is hepatitis C, um, just because back in the day when, <laughs> for most of my career, hepatitis C was every other biopsy. And so the radiologist, doing the report or the assistant to the physician doing the biopsy would just write HCV on it, assuming. And it would be very easy to miss early stage PBC and it's not hepatitis C at all, right? Because they can look so similar. So the practices I was taught by Peter Scheuer um, and he learned from Hans Popper and, and all their descendants practice this way is we look at the slide and see what we find. And that means we're coming at the slide from with the mind of a beginner. Right. The mind of the expert in this case would be someone who thinks they know what the diagnosis is. And this is a real problem in liver pathology in general today because there's so very few people who are trained, people who read liver biopsies are so often GI pathologists who did two months of liver. Well, I did six months of liver with Peter Scheuer at the Royal Free came back and started signing out liver biopsies immediately after. And it was hard to say the very least. Um, I wasn't yet ready. I wasn't yet a liver pathologist. And that's after six months. And um, fortunately, I had mentors back in New York to, to check with and to continue to learn with. So what often happens, and I see this in the consult cases that come my way, um, from other institutions, the pathologist being a little confused, being insecure about the subtleties of the liver biopsy in front of them, look at the clinical history and figure out how it fits. And they come up with the wrong diagnosis, right? Because they're, they're, they're thinking the hepatologist is the expert and taking that information and applying it to the slide. But you have to start as a beginner with the slide and collect what information there's there. You know this, we've done this together at the scope a million right. times. And so that's where it first applied to me, that this idea that you need to come fresh to what's on the slide, otherwise you're gonna make mistakes. And for other organs, it's less common. You know, if you're looking at, um, at polyps, you know, that's a zero problem. But if you're looking at inflammatory changes in the digestive tract, inflammatory changes in the skin, it's easy to go awry because you think you know the complete clinical history. And the job is to actually, from your beginner's mind, come up with the array of possibilities to tell the clinician, because there may be a test they haven't thought of, and it's going to be the pathologist that tells right. them to do it. So that's one way this quote became really important to me. But another way was how often, you know, I, on a regular basis, a resident will come to me, meaning like once a year, maybe twice a year, a resident will come and show me something on a slide, show me a case, 
and say, but what's this thing over here? And I go, I don't know. We see that. Um, and a case where this happened was um, doing immunostaining. This was back in 1994, 95. Um, immunostaining for A1A3, I think, was the first antibody we had that stained biliary epithelium. Um, antibodies. And um, and I commented to Dr. Thung, who was my mentor at the time, that there are these cells, isolated cells away from the portal tract. And um, I asked her what those were. And she said, oh, we see them. We don't know what they are. Professor Popper said maybe they were stem cells, um, but we don't know. And that was it. And I couldn't get this out of my head that there was this unexplained cell. And when we're talking about biological systems, there is no, there's nothing that isn't important in biology. No matter how small, it's going to affect things. So what was this cell? And it turned out it was a cross-section of the canal of herring that led me to, def and then seeing how that changed in disease, disease allowed our group to publish the first paper that proved that livers have stem cells because there was this little extraneous thing. And um, I have a qu favorite quote, uh, and an, an, my first book I'm gonna recommend to people. This is one of my favorite books. Um, and for anyone who likes reading about science and thinking about science and scientists who are interesting, um, this one, it's called, oh, it's backwards. <laughs> yeah, no, we can read it, yeah. Okay, A Feeling for the Organism. The Life and Work of Barbara McClintock by Evelyn Fox Keeler. I highly recommend this book. I think um, you recommended it to me a long time back. I was yeah. about to ask you about it. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a favorite. And she was an extraordinary research scientist who had an extraordinarily extraordinary life, whose work in genetics, she started at the top of her field. She was the first head of the women, uh, first woman to become head of the American Genetics Association in the 1920s, I think it was, early 30s. But then her work became so peculiar looking at corn plants when everyone else was starting to study Drosophila flies that out of respect for her, the lab allowed her to continue her work, but no one knew what she was doing. Um, and then late in her life, someone figured out what she was doing and she wound up winning the Nobel Prize right. for transposons. And she could tell by the current colors of kernels in the corn plants what was changing genetically just by looking at it. And um, so she's kind of remarkable. The book is her story. But she had this quote in the book. There's no such thing as a central dogma into which everything will fit. She's talking about biological systems. Right. Any mechanism you can think of, you will find, even if it is the most bizarre kind of thinking, anything. So if the material tells you it may be this, allow that. Don't turn it aside and call it an exception, an aberration, a contaminant. So many good clues have been lost in that manner. And what she's talking about is beginner's mind versus expert mind. The resident brings me something and I see a little thing and I dismiss it. Oh, that's just an occasion. You see that aberration sometimes, or that's just a contaminant, um, or that's, you know, it's an exception. It's not a big deal. What is being the beginner, the resident saw something and that something has meaning and they saw it and didn't dismiss it because they're a beginner. And so to the residents and trainees and, and junior attendings on the, uh, who are watching this, if one of your mentors ever says to you, oh, we see this, we don't know what it is, it doesn't matter. It's, it's trivial, it's meaningless. There's a whole research career that could blow a field open if you hunt that down, because there's nothing in biology that doesn't have meaning. And the fact is that being a beginner gives you the power to see it in a way that being an expert doesn't. For it's me, my Zen true. practice, which is, which is a meditative practice of continually coming back to the present moment as your mind drifts to worries about the future or obsessions from your past, it's, an, it's a way of restoring that beginner's mind that every time you place a slide on a microscope, it's a contemplative moment. It is a contemplative practice, even if it, you don't think of it as a spiritual one. It is a contemplative meditative one. 
And if you encounter the slide as a true beginner each time, you will see things that are important for the patient, important for the clinician, potentially important for human knowledge. I've, I've stumbled on four different bits of new anatomy in my career, and each time it was because I took notice of something that I had dismissed before. Uh, the interstitium, which you mentioned, I'm not going to go into that in detail, but I had been looking at cracks in connective tissue my whole life, thinking they're artifact and being told they're artifact and teaching like I knew what I was talking about, that they're artifact because dense collagen is so stiff that it cracks when you cut it to make a slide. And it turned out those weren't cracks. They were the remnants of real fluid filled spaces in living tissue. They were an artifact of the way we make slides. Right. So, and Line once you by CD34, as you showed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, lined by weird fibroblasts. I mean, it's still, and it turns out now we know it's it's a body wide communication network that's four times the fluid four times the fluid volume of the cardiovascular system. It's huge, but we've been looking at it, knowing what we know, and dismissing it that these are just cracks. Turns out they're not empty. They're filled with hyaluronic acid and other biomolecules, and they're they're physiologically profoundly relevant. So, so that's what I mean by beginner's mind. And I, I think you know, being Buddhist or not, that's an important distinguish. It a distinct, a, a important thing to distinguish. It plays out in any field, anything you do. Oh, you're an expert parent. No, but your child's going to surprise you in the next moment. Are you really paying attention to the child or you're paying attention to your ideas of the child? So, you know, it's a social too. I think that's a very important uh, point that the mind of a beginner with so many possibilities, as you mentioned, and as you said, that this is so important for the new trainees who just joins pathology that they will find uh, a, a something significant in everything that they see. I think that is something so important that yeah. maybe like as a, when we are teaching the new residents, so we should be pay, paying more attention that, oh, maybe like there is something that, that they have observed which we have not looked at. And this we come across in our practice every day. For example, yesterday I was discussing online with my colleague who is with us in this department uh, from Netherlands. She was talking about, have you seen CMB immunostain staining other small things like lymphocytes, plasma cells, and we always disregard. I said, that is true. You know, whenever we stain like CMB, IAC will stain a lot of yeah. like, inflammatory cells. So we might have just like disregarded why this is so. So mm -hmm. there are so many small subtle things which, uh, you know, stays in the eyes of the beginners and like as we become specialists still we need to have the eye of the beginner so that we can discover things as you say then you're talking about interstitium uh, after your paper whenever i see an invasive colon cancer going into the uh, you know pericolonic muscular wall and i see that the, how these cells are going out and then i see the tattoo dyes in the draining lymph nodes how they are going there and all the way the tattoo from the polypectomy you will see in the muscle wall, you will see in the serosa, you will see in the fat. So we never thought that there is a way how these dyes are going. So and here it is, it must be interstitium. And so, you know, in biology, everything has meaning. Right. There's nothing that doesn't have meaning. And and the other thing is that with beginner's mind, so that CMV staining in lymph, occasional lymphocytes and, and occasional uh, stromal cells, could that be that there's CMV proteins in there? You know, as a beginner, you have to come up with a range of hypotheses the way as a beginner with the liver, I have to come up with a differential diagnosis. But another possibility is that there's the, the antibody for the CMV is cross staining with some other molecule. Right. What's that molecule? Is it right. a molecule anyone has ever identified before? Is right. it a molecule of interest? And suddenly, you know, it you may be going this way and then you go this way. I wasn't a stem cell biologist until I saw those cells near the portal tract staining with keratin. Um, 
I wasn't a basic scientist till then. People think that, oh, I've always been a basic scientist. No, that was the moment I became a basic scientist when we did the tissue biology of the Canal of Herring. I said, I think we've, to my chairman um, at the time, uh, Vittorio Defendi, I said to him, um, I think we've got a paper proving that the liver has stem cells and I know how to identify them. And he said, well, you should apply for a grant. <laughs> And, and go do the research to do that. And I said, I'm not a scientist. I'm not interested in do, going to the bench. I like my clinical work. I don't want to do that. And he pushed me and pushed me. And finally, I applied for a small grant. And unfortunately, I got it. And I was sent to Yale to become a basic scientist. Because I was a beginner in liver pathology with immunostaining. And I saw this thing. And that's, that, you know... And my career went. <laughs> this is great. Uh, actually, you just mentioned about this book. Actually, I was thinking today that I was going to mention this book because uh, back when I was a resident, you introduced this book to me and I purchased it at that time. And And the name itself is so unique that a feeling for, for the organism, uh, something as pathologists, maybe, you know, sometimes we don't think much about it. Uh, many a times we feel that we are not connected to the patient because we don't see the patient, but we are uniquely connected to the patient because every slide that we look at, it's some, it's a, it's a tissue from a patient, and we are actually looking at the patient cells, tissues, how the cells are connected, and and you are a liver pathologist, you know that every liver cell or every liver biopsy tells you a story about the patient. And as you say that, you know, like every cell tells you a story. And how do you think about it? Can you elaborate more? I mean, how being a yeah. liver pathologist, you see this? Well, it reminds me of two things. One, um, when I was a, a resident, one of my senior residents spoke of um, Dr. Carl Persson, who was one of the senior pathologists at Columbia at the time. Um, he might still be practicing, I'm not sure. Um, and he said, the thing about Dr. Person, for us, we look at the slide and we see what the slide tells us about the moment of the biopsy. But for someone like Dr. Person, it's like seeing the frame of a film and they can tell you the film strip that led up to it and what the film is gonna look like following it, right. just because they see the single frame. And so yes, every everything, every single slide we look at is a story. And it's a much bigger story. Um, but something else is that, you know, I, I remember, again, when I was a resident, um, maybe a junior attending, um, there was a, a patient who had colon cancer and had a colectomy. And they reached out because they wanted to see what the tumor looked like. And so we arranged for them to come look at their colon and to see their colon cancer. And she was really surprised. And, I said, what did you think it would look like? And she said, well, when they told me I had cancer in the colon, I just sort of pictured a black cloud. And now you're showing me this thing. And then I took her to see the slides. And it opened up a whole new way for her to imagine her tumor and contemplate what she was going to be, what chemo was about, et cetera, which was very powerful for her. But I, I know that some of my hepatology colleagues, they know how to look at liver biopsies. So when I say something, when I write a description uh, in a report, they can imagine what I'm saying. But there are a lot of gastroenterologists and some hepatologists who really don't have an idea. They see the words acute hepatitis and they just imagine destruction. <laughs> um, right. If I say P if compatible with PSC, they'll imagine an ERCP. Right but they can't imagine the slide itself. They can't imagine the tissue level. We're more intimate with what's going on with the patient, cell to cell, than the clinicians often, even as we're distanced. And, um, and we should feel good about this, you know? It's our superpower. Right. Um, that's why we're useful. Um, and it's why I caution anyone who's looking at liver biopsies, if you, are, if you are making diagnoses by looking at the clinician's history and saying whether it fits or not, you're missing things. And the clinician is ultimately going to stop doing liver biopsies, which may please you, uh, but they're going to stop because you never tell them anything they didn't already know. So why do the biopsy? Right. Um, 
Oh, yeah, this, that's this what I have to thing. say about it. No, that's true. This is a great thing to know about that, like, uh, that uh, every patient is unique. And as pathologists looking at slides, uh, we are unbiased to the true sense of the term because every liver biopsy will have pink and blue hues. And there you look at things, what, what you do and what you find, unbiased again by the clinical uh, picture, at least, yeah. to say the yeah. least. Yeah. So uh, now today, let us move on to another talk. So uh, another topic that definitely we would like to know today that uh, uh, it seems from what you have been saying is that uh, your interest in complexity theory begins with how you have started thinking about the stem cell niche and how it is connected to the molecular and cellular biology. Uh, is it how you got interested in complexity? And can you tell us more about it? Say, for example, what is complexity and mm -hmm. how you got interested into it? Yeah, so briefly, I'll tell the story of how I got interested and then maybe I'll do a little reading from the book. Oh, sure, absolutely. Um, so, um, I had been fortunate in that I had been paired off by one friend of mine with another friend of his. Um, he worked at the University of Westminster at that time and was interested in how interdisciplinary communication takes place. And so this other friend, Jane Prophet, was an artist and um, he got a grant for Jane to come to New York to talk to me and for me to go to London to talk with her about what our, what her art practice was and what my medical and science practice was. And we didn't have to have a project or a report. We just had to, um, they recorded the conversation so other people could study how we communicated. And um, I was telling her about stem cells and stem cell plasticity and bone marrow cells moving through the body and becoming other cells as they entered other locations. And she said, oh, what you're describing sounds like how complexity theorists talk about ant colonies and how ant colonies without any top-down planning form food lines and cemeteries and dig tunnels, um, et cetera. There's no ant in charge of the colony. The queen ant just serves a, uh, a reproductive function. And that was my introduction to complexity theory. It was because I was open to, you know, I was a beginner for her art practice and heard what she was saying. Um, and that led me, led us together to collaborate, an artist, a scientist. We brought in two other guys, um, one who was a mathematician and one was a, a programmer um, to actually study, could we model stem cell behaviors the way complexity scientists model um, ecosystems and economic systems? and ant colonies. And, um, and so um, here's a little intro of, I know I should have put a bookmark. <laughs> oh, no, so, that's fine. To put it to, to, so this is a little intro to complexity theory, and then I'll explain some of the principles, and then I'll read another little piece. Um, this is the beginning of chapter three. Right. Um, and so this is the tale of a pathologist leaving his apartment to go to work at a New York City medical center. Right. When I leave my apartment for the hospital on a spring morning, I'm greeted by trees that are spinning soil, water, light, and air into trunk, branch, and leaf. Likewise, the daffodils and forsythia bursting with yellows. Robins on our building's front lawn tilt their heads, listening for herds of earthworms passing through the ground beneath them. I reach the sidewalk and enter the kinetic stream of New Yorkers intent on their destinations. Somehow they flow easily past each other, making unconscious micro adjustments to shoulder and step so they can stride without interruption. All around us, we can see parts self-assemble into dynamically alive, adaptive, emergent forms and processes. Not only can we see it, but we are part of it. Even through, even though our day-to-day -day habits, our focus on things beyond our bodies may give us the sense of being observers of objects, separate from what we observe. In fact, we are not walking through the world. We are interwoven with it. Everywhere we look, we see complexity. In everything we do, we participate in complexity. 
There are now several research institutes throughout the world dedicated to the study of complexity theory, evidence of its increasing influence in a wide range of fields. What do complexity researchers study? Biology and technology, ecology and climatology, urban life and agriculture, business and economics, anthropology and religion and evolution, time, history, the future. As a result, we now have the opportunity to explore complexity through the simple rules researchers have identified. Um, and so the issue of how parts self-assemble into bigger holes, how do birds, starlings form a murmuration in the sky that looks like a moving balloon or, or spaceship, um, how do molecules become a tree? How do our cells form our bodies? And it turns out the mathematics that describes all these things um, applies regardless of what we're talking about. So cities and ecosystems, um, uh, eco economies, stem cells and cell biology, all of it's described in exactly the same way. And the principles are very, very clear. And in the book, I use ant colonies as an example. Right. But in, um, for, for this audience, I'll come up with some human physiology examples. So the first thing is that numbers matter. Right. Um, two or three cells doesn't make an organism. Um, two or three people don't make a community. In fact, they might just wander off and not talk to each other. But if you have 10 cells or 20 cells, then you start to have a multicellular organism where you get communication and diversity of interactions across the cells, cells beginning to specialize so that each one is doing something different depending on where it's located. Think of the developing embryo. Um, the first few divisions, every cell is equivalent to every other cell. But after four divisions, five divisions, they start to specialize and there becomes a polar difference between one side and the other, et cetera. And the more cells you have and the greater the diversity of interactions, the more complexity you can have. So in human terms, a city is not a village, a village is not a city, is not a megalopolis. Um, a 20 cell creature is not as complex as a thousand cell creature is not as complex as a trillion cell creature like us. Um, so numbers matter. And the more, the more you have and the more diversity of interactions you have, the more complexity you have. The second rule is that there are always balancing negative and fe positive feedback right. loops. Negative feedback loops have to predominate. And I'm assuming everyone in this audience knows what a negative feedback loop and a, a positive one is. So a negative feedback loop is like contact inhibition. A cell dies, drops out, the neighboring cell feels that there's a surface that has no cell on the other side and it divides and fills the spot. Having filled the spot, all cells now have contacts on all sides, they stop dividing. So that's a negative feedback loop. The most common positive feedback loop in the body is um, fever. You know, you get an infection, you start to release cytokines and chemokines, your temperature goes up, and that creates um, a new metabolic region in which you can more efficiently get rid of the infection. But then, but it, it doesn't, it's not open-ended. If it's open-ended, you die of a fever and that's not going to be useful. So we have negative feedback loops that at the appropriate moment come back in and close down on the positive feedback. So you can have positive feedback in an organism and it can be physiologic and functional, but it can't uh, overwhelm the system. What's in the, it, it can't predominate. What's a situation where it predominates? Cancer. Just the simplest thing. They no longer have contact inhibition. So there's nothing to keep them from growing and growing and growing and growing. And then instead of an adaptive living thing, um, you have an energy expending self-limited thing. It will grow, it will self-organize, but ultimately it will destroy itself and obviously the person with it. Um, negative feedback loops on malignant, on cells becoming malignant. We have the immune system. Um, some cancer cells learn to escape immune system surveillance. So that's a dampening of a negative feedback loop to allow the positive feedback of uninhibited growth to take over. Um, and what do our new technology, our, our new successful uh, ther cancer therapeutic agents doing? They're restoring the negative feedback of the immune system. So you can think of this in terms of disease and treatment. 
that many diseases are an example of negative feedback loops having been eroded or positive feedback loops having been promoted so that they're out of balance. And the therapy is to restore that balance somehow. Talking about homeostasis, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should have used the word, yeah. To keep things in homeostasis or return things to homeostasis. Mm -hmm. The third thing is that... Um, Everything is local. There's no global surveillance. There's no cell in the body that's figuring out whether you're happy or horny or hungry or thirsty or sleepy. Um, every cell is simply responding to what it perceives in its local environment. And that includes signals that may have come from afar, like a hormone um, or a nerve signal. But to the cell it's impacting, it's just local. Oh, look, this hormone is right here. Quick, hits the receptor and the cell changes. So... Um, everything, you know, you can look at the body and think, oh, it looks like it was designed to work this way, but there's no design. This is all a bottom-up phenomenon. And the, the phrase for this is emergent self-organization. You have emergent properties of organization at the global level that no matter how much reductionist biology you did at the cellular level, you couldn't predict the nature of this. You couldn't look at hepatocytes and stromal cells and lymphocytes that you've separated from the liver and have any guess that they would self-assemble into an organ that would have these functions. Um, and the final thing that there's always some quench disorder in the system. And this to me is the most profound thing. Um, if there's too much disorder, then things can't self-organize. Ants don't become colonies. Um, human communities become, anar you know, erupt in anarchy. Um, cells couldn't become tissues. They couldn't function together. But if there's too little randomness, then if the environment changes, there's no opportunity to, uh, to explore a new uh, adaptation. And so um, you need a, a low-level randomness in the system. And what this low-level randomness in the system does is it creates uh, one mentor of mine in complexity theory named Stu Kaufman, um, who's really the father of complexity as applies to biology. I'm really lucky to have him as, as a teacher. Um, he talks about this as the adjacent possibles. So in every moment of a complex system, there are an array of possible outcomes. It's not an infinite possible number of outcomes. It's a constrained number of possible outcomes, but it's only utterly unpredictable which of those will create the next moment. And the next moment happens, all of those adjacent possibles disappear and a new cloud of adjacent possibles happen. So biology, living things are not machines. They can't be predicted because there's always this range of, of unpredictability. Um, and one of the important things about that is that sometimes, inevitably, given enough time, one of the adjacent possibles will be death. And so what makes, you know, th this low-level randomness is what allows for creative adaptation, that allows a living thing to change in response to the environment, and those survive, be alive. But the flip side of that creative adaptability is the inevitability of death. There's no such thing as a fountain of youth um, or eternal life, regardless of what people who are you know, now on the internet are talking about living forever. It ain't gonna happen because uh, the only thing that doesn't die is something that isn't alive in the first place. That, that's, right. that's very deep. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and where I came to this, uh, we don't have much time because I talk too much. Um, I was going to the, the opening of chapter four, but um, I'll just say it in a nutshell. When I was talking to Jane um, about this, I became aware that I'm able to imagine what the cells are doing at the cellular level because I spend my day looking at the body at the cellular level. And then there's a knock on the door and I look up and someone's come in to consult or, or a resident has come in to look at some slides and suddenly I'm back at the the present day level. And at this level of scale, you're sitting there, I'm sitting here, and we're separated by miles. But if you were in the room, we'd still think of ourselves as just as separate. But at the cellular level, we've, our body is covered by the microbiome, and we're leaving our microbiome everywhere. 
And we now know that if you have a bunch of people living in an apartment together with a couple of pets, um, there's a single microbiome, which is an organism that has some human dog and cat colonies, islands to land on, but they rapidly become this single organism. So at the cellular level, our boundaries are not our skin. Our bodies are not machines with inside and outside. We're porous and we, we communicate with the environment. So are cells things? No, they're just self-organizing molecules. And at the molecular level, we're exchanging molecules with the biomass of the planet all the time. Molecules are just self-organizing cells, and those are just self-organizing subatomic particles, and those, now we're down in the quantum realm, and there's no inside and outside in the quantum realm. The Nobel Prize was for entanglement and, and uh, non-locality last year. So the farther down you go in scale, the greater, you, the wider your boundaries become, and we get to a zone where there is no separation. Um, and all of those things are absolutely true. And even though they seem to contradict each other, they exist in complementarity. Like when you have that image of, oh, I can show that image. When you have that image of two faces and a vase. Um, let's see if I can find it quickly. No. Um, <laughs> uh, two faces in profile looking at each other and the space between them looks like a vase. Is it the two faces or is it the vase? You can't really see them both at the same time. And if you say one or the other, you only have half the story. Both are true, equally true, just as each of these uh, scale-based views of the body are true. Um, without all of them, you have an incomplete understanding of the body. And that's part of the problem with molecular and cell biology. They're not thinking that, oh, there are these other scales that are equally valid. And how many of the molecular people are really thinking about energetic bodies? and quantum bodies. And that's, you know, why can't Western medicine deal with things like energy healing? Because we're locked into one level of scale or two, rather than seeing the whole thing. So that's where comes the concept of biology, isn't it? It's a, it's a part of it. Yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I, I had, um, I was already moving in that direction. Um, but complexity theory gave me a precise language and a precise mathematics. And I'm not a mathematician. I don't do the math. Um, but, but I explain it in the book right. and the book notice is very thin. <laughs> it's only 171 pages, right? 172. Yeah, absolutely. But this is a great book. So, uh, I, uh, this book is available online on Amazon and I was lucky to get a copy from Dr. Tease himself. Thank you so much. And, uh, I want to say a couple of things. Like there are a lot of, uh, Oh, great reviews about the book. I would like to read one from Dr. Deep, uh, from Deepak Chopra, who says that this is an extraordinary book that will change the way you understand yourself and the universe. It will empower you. We should all be indebted to Neil Thies for this monumental contribution to the science behind all reality. So, I mean, uh, my question is, Dr. Thies, so you are a liver pathologist. You are a stem cell researcher. Or you are a... Uh, practicing gen practicing uh, person as well. And how you got uh, encouraged or inspired to write this book or come up with this book and how it is connected to pathology. I'm sure that there is some way these all things are connected. So can you, yeah. can you tell us about it? Yeah, you know, the, the book came about because I started giving talks on this right. part. Um, and I've been giving talks on this for 20 years. You can find them all over the internet. Mm -hmm. Um, and often as I gave talks, I would meet someone every few years, I'd meet someone who would have a tidbit that I hadn't had before. Um, but really, the answer is, once Jane had set me on the road, um, it was practicing beginner's mind. They tell me in Western biology that all living things are made of cells. That's an assumption. Is the body really just cells? No, I've just gone from the the everyday scale to the cellular level, can I go down lower? What happens at the lower level? I'm at the molecular level. Oh, complexity applies to all of this. So I started working on that. And then the question, are molecules then a fundamental thing? Beginner's mind, no. <laughs> and, and just continuing all the way down. So it was really just 
um, it's been a journey of, and then every once in a while, I would meet someone who would say, oh, the answer to that question is this, something I'd never heard before. And as an as a beginner, again, I could ask questions that were theoretically not supposed to be asked. And eventually, um, um, I found an agent who convinced me to write this book, <laughs> and I spent COVID writing the book. Um, and now it's a book. <laughs> <laughs> How did that happen? It feels like a self-organizing phenomenon. I feel like um, all this knowledge was a bottom-up thing um, that I was not in control of. I just went along for the ride. You know, uh, in the book, you also talk about, and you have mentioned that today also, that about chaos and randomness and you say that the degree of randomness is important it should be low level of randomness not a lot of it and i hear you talk about how a single ant which goes away from the line of ant colonies and maybe goes to the kitchen and you know find something so and and how do you relate randomness chaos in the practice of pathology and science in general right well so the random ant thing is um, from a distance, you see a line of ants and it looks like a straight line. But if you lean down closely, you see there are three or four ants, three or four percent that aren't following the line. It turns out those are the ants that if you step your foot in the front of the line, in the middle of the line, just distur disturbing it, those ants are the ones that follow the new route around the foot. Or we'll find the new food source over here while all these ants are schlepping back and forth from this food source. So that low level randomness is what helps explore other possibilities. Um, what Jane saw in our stem cell work was people were dismissing our bone marrow um, to other organ work because um, in normal organs, you'd find one in, two, one, one in a thousand cells from the bone marrow, one in 10,000 cells. And a lot of people dismissed it as trivial. That was the word, this is trivial. Even if it's true, this is trivial. But what complexity show you, shows you is the trivial is that low level unpredictability. And what we showed in a few uh, human models as well as some animal models, that when there's disease and injury, that becomes the pathway of healing. In some cases, the dominant pathway of healing. So what you see in the ants, we see in the, in the human body as well. Um, that's the primary way I, I think of that. Um, I'm sure I can come up with other, some other connections, but my brain is getting tired. <laughs> no, no. I mean, but that was actually, right. that was the primary, that observation was the primary thing that Jane, my artist friend, connected my work to complexity theory. It was precisely that question. Right. Uh, like I, I, I was reading that, uh, and you are talking about in one of your chapters um, the story about connecting and the connection between Godel and Einstein. I think uh, this is something very fascinating. So do you want to say something about it to our viewers? Oh my God. Um, do you mean about their relationship? No, like uh, the, 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 that how in the later days, you know, that Einstein shared like you know i mean um that they, right their relation that they were together at princeton right, right yeah so i i spend a lot of time in the book in the second half talking about Gödel. basically i didn't realize i was writing this at the time i was writing it but it turns out to be a critique of materialism too um the materialist science is just wrong on its own terms and um this idea that um the the best way to understand the true nature of reality is through empirical science. Well, that was messed up by quantum physics. And now I show in the book also by complexity theory and the idea that math could completely and consistently explain everything in the universe um, in a formal way was blown apart by Gödel because he showed that if you had a consistent system of mathematics, it would necessarily be incomplete. There would be something that would be true about the world that could not be proven to be true from in the system. And how would you know something is true um, if you can't prove it's true? Through intuition. And so this was a mathematician showing that intuition has a role in understanding the nature of existence. And so that broke apart the idea of materialism. 
And that's a whole discussion. But he wound up at Princeton because of World War II. He was from Vienna. Um, like, uh, like, like, like Einstein wound up because of Hitler at the Institute for Advanced Studies. And Einstein at this point was an older man. Um, his best ideas were behind him, though he st still had a few in his pocket. And Goethe was still a young man, um, about 20 years younger than, than Einstein was. 30, maybe 30 or 40, um, 30. And um, maybe because they were both immigrants fleeing Hitler, maybe because they were both German speakers and could speak to each other in their native language. Um, but they were undoubtedly two of the greatest minds of the 20th century, perhaps of all time. And every day they would walk to their offices in the morning and every day they would walk um, home together. And at one point, Einstein actually said about Gödel that the reason he got up in the morning to go to work was to have the privilege of working with Gödel. And unfortunately for Gödel, um, Einstein died in 1956, I think it was, and Gödel had another decade and a half to live. Einstein died a pretty unhappy person with, um, he had was a great mind who really messed up the people around him. His family was a mess. Um, he was disappointed with his final years because quantum physics turned out to be something that he had helped give birth to was something that was in his mind, a disaster. Um, and Gödel actually became psychotic and starved himself to death because he was afraid of um, becoming poisoned. And Gödel, himself said that his disappointment in his life was that for all his great accomplishments of mind, and I think you can say this about Einstein, about Heisenberg, about many great scientists, it had never given, never given him an awareness of the true nature of reality that could ease his suffering and that could help him be resilient in the face of what life is. Um, they both died unhappy. And um, and to me, what I think that points to is that, you know, this I, I, I wrote a book, yay, but this is just concepts. And if it doesn't lead to some sort of practice, whatever that practice is, it can be the practice of science, it can be the practice of writing poetry, it can be the practice of serving others, it can be meditating on a cushion. If you don't have some sort of practice, it can be the practice of serving your community of physicians and of patients by looking conscientiously at your slides day after day with the intention that you are being of service to them. That's enough to give you a sense of connection that takes it beyond just facts and figures um, and, and to a life of meaning, I think, and a life with some resilience. Right, no, that's, that's really very thought-provoking, Dr. Tees. At this point, I would like to see that uh, what our viewers might have some questions for you. They are posting their questions on Facebook and YouTube. So let me see what I find. Uh, one of our viewers from Italy, uh, Luca, has sent this picture. So he is saying that uh, he has this book of Kaufman. Yes, this one. I, I can't see it through the screen. Oh, wait, let me turn it up. What's the title? I think it's in it's in Italian. Uh, oh. as Esplorazioni Evolutive. I don't. <laughs> He's written many books. They're all good. <laughs> right, right, yeah. And uh, there is an, one question I found on YouTube. Let me read that for you. Um, the question is uh, one second. So the viewer says thanks to you for this fascinating talk. And the question is like this. So what do you think of the entropic principle? Can it be the basis of self-organized complexities and of emergent properties? Uh, I have, I, I, you know, this and the multiverse are the questions I get all the time. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just a liver pathologist. There are some questions that just tire me, and that would be one of them. Right, right. Sorry. <laughs> no, actually, in your book, uh, 
you mentioned about emergent emergence in general, and you mentioned about fractals as well. And someone is asking about like, what do you mean by emergence? And if you want to elaborate on that. You know, it's really slippery to get your hands on it. It's, you know, how out of the local interactions of ants or the local interactions of your cells, do you get um, food lines and tunnel diggers and warrior ants <laughs> that can attack other ant colonies um, if there's no one planning in a top-down way? So um, it's what I said before. It's these global uh, characteristics that emerge from the local interactions of the cells or the people or the ants that are making up the system. And it's kind of magical and mysterious. I mean, there, it's more of a philosophical, the fact is this happens, but what is it exactly? How does that happen? Um, this is one of the reasons complexity sort of leads you into the mystical in some ways. Right. And I, I read, uh, so there is another question about it here uh, from your book is that, uh, in the very early chapters, you talked about this concept that was uh, the whole is bigger than the sum of its parts, sum of its parts, right? And uh, so, do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah. So you know, a machine is exactly the sum of its parts. You can look at you know, a good engineer can look at the pieces, you know, metal pieces on a table and tell you whether it's going to assemble into a clock or a toy car, right? Um, and it can only be arranged in precisely that fashion. Um, and so the car or the clock are precisely the sum of its parts. And there's no chance for any other alternate behaviors. Um, and machines break <laughs> um, and they don't adapt. Whereas this, uh, this notion of emergence, you have these global things that you can't predict if you, you can know what every single cell of your body is doing. Just take five cells in a culture. Day. You can know everything there is to know about those cells. If that were actually possible, and I've actually published on something called cellular uncertainty, that's like Heisenberg's uncertainty. It's not possible to know everything about a cell. There are limits, but that's a separate thing. You have these five cells. What, is it going to, what are they going to turn into when they start interacting? You can't predict it. You can develop computer models, and this is how people study complex systems. You can create a computer model that tries to predict it, and then you'll see whether it's right or wrong. And if it's wrong, then you know you don't understand something about how the cells interact. So you do experiments to find out more. The more you know, the closer you'll get. But in any given circumstance, because of the low-level randomness, the computer system will never precisely predict what the cells are going to do. And every time you run, and if it's a good computer program, every time you run it, it will do something a little different. Uh, I talk in the beginning about a computer game, basically, called The Game of Life right. that was published in 1970. Not going to elaborate it on it here, but really, that's what led to complexity theory. Chaos theory and fractals had come first in the 1960s and 70s. Um, because of the game of life, complexity was revealed as the next thing. And, um, and, what, and, and that statement is true. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. It can't be inferred what the whole will be simply because you understand what the parts are. Reductionism has its limits. You have to come back to systems. So people talk about uh... See, there is a, I'm sure that there is a difference between something which is complicated and which is complex. And life, as you say in your book, that life itself is the most uh, complex, you know, like uh, there is nothing more complex than life. Nothing in the universe is more complex than life. How do you differentiate between complicated and complex? Complicated is more a limitation of my mind. Um, some days I can handle something that's more complicated. These days I can only handle things that aren't too complicated. Um, but uh, complexity is a technical term that refers to interacting individuals that fulfill those four rules. And then you have true complexity, mathematical complexity, scientific organizational complexity, living complexity. So com complexity in common parlance 
you know, as a common term, you can use them sort of interchangeably. But complicated is really not about the thing you're looking at. It's about, is it too complicated for me to understand? There's always someone else who can understand it, even if you can't. Uh, no, I haven't yet. I would admit that I haven't finished your book, but some of the things that I have read is really very curious because uh, being a student of pathology, I see that, that there are a lot of things which have connection to pathology and which might be difficult to appreciate by viewers who, who are not in pathology, but this is a great book for everyone. I see something in the book, you talk about fractals and how they are related to the structure of blood vessels and capillaries and things like that, right? Do, do you want to yeah, say about yeah. that? Well, so that's chaos theory. And I have to, like I said, complexity followed on chaos and fractals are important. Um, so there are aspects of living systems that are not best described by complexity, but described by fractal, fractal geometry and chaos. And so you look in the natural world and you see the branching of trees you look at a, um, uh, a satellite view of a river system and it looks like branching rivers, but if you do a black and white image and don't tell the person how you're seeing the view, um, they could look the same. One could look like a tree and the other one could look like a river system and our blood vessels in our bodies. So there are, comp and if, if you measure how a heart beats, that's a chaotic system that you can model using chaos theory that's very similar to how they model the weather. Um, so there are parts of our bodies that, and there are parts of our bodies that are purely mechanical, like a le you know, your arm is a lever arm. So different perspectives, different levels of scale, um, different ways of viewing require different kinds of mathematics and science and, and uh, physics to describe them. So that's all. It's just, you know, right. all of these, these things are at play in our bodies. Yes, our viewer from Italy is back with the translation of the name of the book from uh, by mm -hmm. Kaufman, The Origin of Order, Self-Organization oh, yeah, and yeah, Selection. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so this is um, much of what I talk about in this book. I cite his book in mine. Um, and much of what I talk about it in the early chapters is comes from Stuart and from that book, Origins of Order. But it's a big, thick book, and it's very, very, very highly technical. Um, it's not light reading. Um, but uh, at the end of my book, I have a whole list of further reading, both the things I cite in the book, things for a lay audience, as well as things for people who are more sophisticated um, scientifically or, or mathematically to, to look up on. Um, he has also written books um, for a, a more general audience that are far simpler than that one. And those are listed in the back of my book too. And soon I have, a, I now have a website because of the book, neilfeastofficial.com. I used to have neilfeast.com and I lost control of it. So we had to make a new one. So it's neilfeastofficial.com. And that's going to have a list of further readings on the website too. You know, thank you, Dr. Tease. So there is one question from one of our viewers. I think the viewer has read the book who asks that uh, in your book, you talk about complexity, you talk about complementarity, and you talk about consciousness. How do you relate these to the practice of pathology? And what do you have to say to the practicing pathologists or students of pathology? That's everything we've talked about since this program started. <laughs> Hit replay <laughs> and, and listen with that in mind. <laughs> I, I don't think there's more. Right. Right. No, I think uh, these are most of the questions that I found online. And maybe yeah, there is one last question uh, asking about holarchy versus hierarchy that you talked about in the book. Um, so we think of things as top down and you think of a good example is we think of societies as having a leader and a leadership group. And then, you know, it's a hierarchy and orders come down from the top and information flows up from the bottom. Um, but the fact is that um, you can compress that and see that it's all a single web. There is no up or down. And so this is a holarchy rather than a hierarchy. Every single, the, the leader may have more connections to more nodes, but it's really a flat web than a top-down or bottom-up kind of thing. And in terms of uh, 
this notion of where are your boundaries at different levels of scale. My finger is bounded by my skin at this level of scale. It's out here in the room with the microbiome. Here I'm touching the screen and sharing my microbiome with it. Um, at the atomic level, it's the entire planet. At the quantum level, it's the entire universe. All of those things are true simultaneously in a holarchy. None of them are more important than the other. None of them supersedes the other. We make one seem important because we focus our attention on my finger as a thing or my finger as a collection of cells, et cetera. Um, so that's the difference between holarchy and hierarchy. This idea that um, there's a priority to any view, that's what's wrong. And that's what's wrong with a lot of our science and a lot of our medicine. Um, that we think that there's one view that pri is the priority and no view has the priority. They're all equally valid and important. Thank you, Dr. Thies. Uh, I think these are all the questions that we have online from, from the viewers who has watched the lecture. And uh, you would be happy to hear that we had viewers from across the world. And uh, there were people who joined from Bangladesh, Pakistan, Kenya, Italy, uh, India, uh, Canada, Australia, to name a few. And uh, thanks to- An example of holarchy. <laughs> <laughs> so would you, I would like to request you to sum up the, uh, the book and today's discussion and interaction about <laughs> complexity. That's the same problem with the other question. There's no summing this up. Um, I, I just, want to say I'm really grateful to be able to discuss this with pathologists in a pathology context, because pathology, as you said, pathology is where this came from. Looking at slides showed me that there are these funny cells outside the portal tract. That showed me that there are structures we didn't know in the liver. That showed me that there were stem cells in the liver. That showed that led me to complexity theory, and everything just unfurled. If I hadn't been a pathologist, had I been a psychiatrist, I never could have written this book. I might've written some other book, but it wouldn't have been this one. Um, it all comes from me being a pathologist. So, so to share it with pathologists um, and maybe inspire a little bit about how precious what we do as a daily practice is and how, how unique it is, um, that makes me very happy. Well, thank you, Dr. Thies. I would like to sum up with one note. Uh... Uh, again, another uh, review of your book by Mark Epstein, who, is say, who says that notes on complexity takes us inside the cell and outside the galaxy to deepen our understanding of the mysteries of which we are made. A fascinating and thought-provoking journey that filled me with wonder. I'm sure uh, this book is available now on Amazon and definitely those, those of us pathologists who are interested to know deeper, to understand our practice in a different way with a different perspective of complexity, please go online and I have shared the link on Facebook and YouTube so and you would be able to have it. And I, is this book available to our international audience, uh, Dr. T? It is, but more slowly. Um, you can get it online. Local bookstores are starting to have it in Europe, I know. And it will be translated into Mandarin and to Hungarian, of all things. Oh. I know that so far. So it'll be available all through uh, China um, and uh, by next year, probably. But I think if you have access to the internet, you can probably get it sent to you. Or come to USCAP, and maybe I'll have a table set up. <laughs> uh, next, yeah, that would be amazing. So all pathologists will be able to uh, have a copy of that book. So thank you again, Dr. Thies. It was an honor to host you on today's program and giving us a perspective about so many different uh, intricacies uh, about how the pathologists practice uh, our, you know, clinical medicine, our science, our research, how you want to talk about, call it. Call it. So uh, thanks again, Dr. Thies, and I would like to thank our viewers for joining us today from all over the world. And if you like our lectures, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow the uh, Facebook page. And our next talk is on uh, Friday, that is on 26th of May, and we will have a board review talk on Lymph Node Pathology by Dr. Eve Crane from Cleveland Clinic and join us at 9 a.m. Pacific time. So hope to see you all.
Thank you again, Dr. Thies. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.